Starting today, we're, we're going back to our usual class setting, and we are going to very soon go through our entire Confession of Faith, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. It might take a couple of years, and, and for a church that holds to that confession, I guess it's only appropriate that we spend some time studying the doctrines contained in our confession and seeing how these truths are drawn out from the Scriptures. But before we get into that, before we study the confession, or you, I should say, before we use the confession as a study tool, a subordinate standard to, to study the truths of Scripture systematically, <clears throat> I wanted us to spend a few weeks considering confessionalism. What is confessionalism? So today we're going to look at the importance and use of creeds and confessions. That's, that's a subtitle. We're, we're titling this Cheerful Confessionalism, which uh, if, you, if you ever listened to a podcast called The London Lyceum, I just ripped it off of that. Uh, this, is, this, is not a, um, this is not a commendation for that podcast in its entirety, um, but I, I am cheerful and confessional. Yes? Uh, how, how forced are we to be cheerful? Uh, you're not forced. That's the beautiful thing. <laughs> Truly confessional folks are filled with cheer from the Lord. Yes. Yeah, if you're not cheerful, maybe you don't, you don't understand your confession, right? That's what's going on. So let's, let's begin in a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful, Lord, for worship this morning. We thank you for the means of grace. We thank you that we could, we could meditate upon our eternal security in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd. Thank you for those beautiful words that no one can snatch us from your hand. And now, Lord, as we study, um, or at least as we consider and, and think about why we're confessional, what in the world a creed is, why it's important, and why Christians throughout church history have not only written these things, but have set them forth, and many of them are so timeless. We pray, Lord, that you would connect us with our rich Christian heritage. We thank you that we are a people whom you have called to confess the truth. And we thank you for these aids and the godly men that have gone before us that have placed what we believe in such fine and succinct words, sentences, and paragraphs that can help us to see the Catholicity, the, the universality of the church. We, we pray that we would find joy in the fact that we're not coming up with new doctrine, but that we are confessing things that have been long believed. Lord, may we be a people that are not into theological novelty to come up with things that have never been um, that have never been thought of, or at least that have never been precipitated in, in the history of the church. And in all of this, we pray, Lord, that it would help us be better students of Scripture, that it would help us dive deeper into the Word, and may we know what we believe and confess it boldly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as we prayed just now, you notice how I was praying with an emphasis of our connection to our rich Christian heritage. That is not to say that we believe foolishly that every Christian for the past 2,000 years has been a Baptist, for example. It is not to say that every Christian throughout history has held to our very same confession of faith. Even though there are certain distinctives in our confession of faith that might set us apart from other Christians, even other Reformed Christians. The point here is that these confessions, and if you're familiar with them, then that, that's good. If not, then hopefully you get, to intro get introduced to that. These are deeply rooted in the Christian tradition. Now, I want to talk about that word real quick. We are afraid of tradition these days. We often talk about how we're not into tradition, we're just into the Bible. Well, here's the thing. The Bible speaks of tradition in various ways. It speaks of man's tradition in a negative way. Those man-made traditions that lay aside the law of God, those unbiblical commands that the legalists might throw upon the people of God without God's counsel, without God's command. And that's a bad tradition. But the New Testament also speaks of the traditions of the apostles or the apostolic tradition. These are good traditions. 
These are, these are teachings, sayings, and practices that are firmly rooted in the Word of God. So, for example, when I say that in Christian history, we have a rich tradition of developing a robust doctrine of the Trinity, all right, we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, you won't find the very word Trinity in the Bible, neither will you find some in-depth philosophical discussion in the New Testament about the distinction between being and persons and so on and so forth. But we believe that these meditations are drawn out by necessary implication from the clear teaching of the scripture so that when the Christian tradition has a long developed understanding that we have one God who exists in three persons, that there is a distinction between Father, Son, and Spirit, but we believe in God, in triunity, well, this is a good tradition, a tradition that should be kept, a tradition that should be protected because it is a tradition that is derived from the Holy Word of God our final authority. So that brings us now to one of the big ways that biblical truth, apostolic tradition has been preserved. Okay? The number one way that God's preserved that is through the preservation of the scriptures. Praise the Lord for the preservation of the scriptures. But you and I know that even with the word of God, there are many groups out there that claim to hold to the same Bible as we do, but they believe differently. Like, for example, using the same example, they don't believe, they reject the doctrine of the Trinity. Not only do they therefore go against the Christian tradition, they go against a biblical Christian tradition which teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. Yes? Doesn't 1 John 5-7 make the Trinity pretty clear? I believe so. Now, there are some discussions about 1 John 5-7. But uh, not only that verse, potentially, but we believe as Christians that many, many, many verses in the Bible teach the doctrine of the Trinity explicitly. The problem is that people will read those same verses and they will disagree with you. So now what? So thank you for actually asking that question because that <laughs> brings us very well into the importance and use of creeds and confessions. Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, they claim to believe in the same Bible plus some other stuff and they claim a lot of their false beliefs are from the Bible. And that's when creeds and confessions come in. Chad Van Dixhorn, who wrote the book, Confessing the Faith. By the way, if you're a member here, you've probably heard a lot of this stuff, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Quote, confessions are doctrinal summaries of the Bible's teaching. They are written by the church for the church and the world. They are written for the world because churches with creeds and confessions are trying to be honest about themselves. These doctrinal statements announce that this is a church that has beliefs and is willing to list the most important ones for all to see. This is the very thing that cults and sects refuse to do. When they arrive at your door on Saturday mornings, they discuss all things peripheral. Their pamphlets hide what they believe, and so do their websites. So this gives you an idea of what we do with a confession. With a confession, we are saying, not only do I claim to believe the Bible, I'm willing enough to tell you what I believe the Bible says, what I believe the Bible teaches. Uh, Chad continues, things are different in Orthodox churches and have been so from the beginning. Not only were the Christians of the early church forced to explain themselves to governors unhappy with the exclusive claims of Christians, they also needed to explain their summaries, explain their faith simply to new converts wanting summaries of the Bible's teaching. Creeds and confessions um, serve this purpose well. So, if you have a new Christian, they've just been born again, Realistically, the average new Christian will not be able to study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation thoroughly um, in their first year of being a Christian. You've just got to be honest. But we believe that God's riches, God's word is so rich, that is, that teachers in the church especially, they have a duty to then disciple that new convert and to take them through the Bible's most important heads of doctrine. 
the essentials of the Christian faith. Hey, I know you're a new Christian. I know you haven't read the Bible cover to cover, but you've been born again. You believe in the true gospel. I want you to know the God of the scriptures. I want you to know that he created everything. I want you to know that he came in the flesh and his name is Jesus Christ. I want you to know that he's both God-man. He's not a demigod. He really is God-man, that he actually died on the cross, that he was buried, that he did rise on the third day. I want you to know he's coming back. And that is your hope. We need to be able... So there you go. That's a creed right there for you. They summarize what God's word has to say about God and they state succinctly the horror of the fall and then the wonder of the gospel. Now, I think that's a really good explanation of the function of a confession of faith. So, in one of the last books of your New Testament, towards the end, you've got Jude. And we brought this up a couple of sermons ago, how Jude was eager to write to the saints about their common salvation, but, and if you look at verse later, because false teachers have crept into the congregations to deceive God's people and they were des destined for wrath long ago, because of this, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you, listen to the language, to contend for the faith, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So we believe that in the scriptures, in the apostolic witness and tradition, a, a faith has been delivered to the saints. A, a system of truth, doctrine, the Christian religion has been given to the saints once for all. So at the very least, this verse should teach us that any talk about creeds and confessions written after the apostolic era, the function of these things is not to bring new truth. It's not to say new, to teach new doctrines. It's to take the Christian religion, the truths which are in the scripture, some of them more explicit, some of them more implicit, and to draw them out and to state them to the people using sound, succinct words that can be understood by men. We use these things then, and we have used these creeds and confessions throughout history, indeed to contend for the faith. Oh, oh what's going on? So, let's define our terms real quick, all right? What is a creed? We've been using these words. Well, the creed is a system of religious belief or a faith. Credo literally means I believe. A creed is a statement of belief. It is a statement of religious belief. It is what you believe, okay? A confession, on the other hand, <clears throat> in substance, it's the same thing. It's a statement setting out essential religious doctrine. But usually, um, historically, we talk about creeds as many of the, the early Christian creeds that, that essentially are short summaries of the substance of the faith, of, of the very essence of the faith. You, you cannot be a Christian if you believe the early creeds such as the, if you do not hold to or affirm the early creeds like the Apostles' Creed. If you don't believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're simply not a Christian. Confessions then, especially towards the days of the Reformation, are much more robust, systematic, encyclopedic summaries of faith that not only touch on the essential of what it means to be a Christian, but begin to touch on things such as the Christian life, the nature of the church, how one is saved, the return, more details on, let's say, the future, the return of Christ, uh, the doctrine of salvation in more depth. So that's why oftentimes when we talk about these longer confessions like the Westminster, the London Baptist, um, we call them confessions. But, you know, the, the creed and confession are, are hitting on the same thing. To confess in the uh, Greek New Testament means to bind oneself, to promise, to profess openly. Okay? So here's a question. If you were an old covenant Jew, what would be a creed? Not the whole thing. But what would be something very basic that must be part of your creed, your beliefs? Anybody? Yeah, Dosh. Oh, good job. So, you definitely must believe this. You could not be a true blue Old Covenant Jew if you did not believe that the Lord our God, the Lord 
is one. Amen. Absolutely. And there is not two different religions in the Bible. There is one true faith. And so I ask you, do Christians affirm this? Yes. 100%. Absolutely. And Christians, in one of our earliest creeds, talked about how in the beginning, God, the one God, created the heavens and the earth. But we're not living in the days of the Old Testament. We have the fullness of God's revelation all the way to the last chapter of the book of Revelation. We have a much deeper and fuller revelation of who God is, the nature of salvation, and so on. So it only makes sense that in the Apostles' Creed, we would say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But of course, as a Christian, you must affirm, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Right? Now take note, things get a little bit tricky here because there are some people out there who would claim that they affirm the Apostles' Creed, right? But they believe that the Father and the Son are the same person. So I think I would just attribute that to this point, to dishonesty in language and to dishonesty in um, what you're claiming to believe. But I digress. A good creed or confession exposits and summarizes Scripture. Okay? Hammer that into your minds. That's what a good creed or confession is supposed to do. That means there are bad creeds and bad confessions. All right? There have been creeds written throughout Christian history that we do not like. Why? Because we read the scriptures, we read the creed, and we saw that creed is not consistent with the scriptures. There are confessions of faith. You read it and you say, no, biblically, we have to disagree with that. That's one of the reasons we don't hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith and we hold to the London Baptist Confession of Faith because we read the Westminster Confession of Faith and we said this was awesome, this was great, but you got a few things wrong with this according to the Bible, like this whole infant baptism thing. Yes? So, we usually hold to the first few ecumenical creeds. There's a bunch of other creeds that uh, are not necessarily the worst, but we don't affirm them, such as, Ilya, give us one. Uh, sure, uh, the Third Constantinople, uh, which is, uh, and, the, and the Council of Ephesus, condemning uh, uh, anybody who says that images uh, should not be used for their life. If you say images should not be used, you're anathema. That's right. That creed. That's exactly what I was thinking, Sinatsua. <laughs> so, that creed, right? That creed anathematizes um, iconoclasts, people who are against images. We are a people against images. So once upon a time, around the medieval era, Christians came together and they wrote a creed. And it was a consensus document at that time. At that time, a lot of them believed this, that we should use images in worship. We read that, we read the Bible, and we go, bad creed. Bad creed. A good creator confession exposits and summarizes Scripture. Now you're wondering, if Scripture is so clear, it's so great, and you know, in the early church with the apostles and all of that stuff, like, they were so pure in their doctrine and everything, why did the early church use creeds? Well, a few reasons. Firstly, because they believed that to be a Christian, one must believe certain core biblical truths. Okay? You don't find out that someone is a Christian because they're holding a Bible. And they say, I believe all this stuff. You're like, what? what's the stuff? Right? You need to know. What are these core things? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Look at this. A little summary profession of faith, and we're hearing stuff about what? Jesus being Lord? We're hearing stuff about saving faith? It's something that's wrought in the heart, and we know from other scriptures by God. We're hearing about Jesus rising from the dead? So it's actually essential for a Christian to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And we think about some of our gospel presentations, and let's be honest, we often miss out on that, don't we? We often have a deficient presentation of the gospel. We sometimes give off the impression that Jesus is still dead. We talk there all day about how Jesus died for your sins. Jesus died for your sins. Believe in Him and be saved. What did the Apostle Paul say? If He didn't rise from the grave, we, to all, we of all people are to be pitied. So we preach a, not a dead and crucified still Christ, dead, crucified, buried, and resurrected Christ. And any true Christian must believe that He rose from the dead. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. A little bit of context through that Roman era at that time, when Christians would be persecuted because they did not want to worship Caesar, because they hailed Jesus Christ as Lord, they would be put before the people. And they would, be, they would be told, recant 
your faith in Christ. Say, Kaiser Kuryu, Caesar is Lord. And many of the faithful Christians would then answer back in front of everyone by saying, Yesu Kuryu, Jesus is Lord. And subsequently, they would usually be killed or beheaded. What we confess says a lot about what's going on in our hearts. Sometimes there is a disjunction, a disunity, but what we confess with our mouth, what we say we believe, ought to be consistent with what is in our heart. Everyone who acknowledges me, says Jesus, before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Christians are a confessing people a professing people. Our faith is not a private faith. It is a public faith. And anybody who wants to know our, um, what our faith is shouldn't have a hard time knowing what it is. So certain core truths. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. So we summarized it from the earliest days and said, this is what it means to be a Christian. You've got to believe at least this. You've got to believe there's only one God, okay? If you believe there's five gods, I'm, you're just not a Christian. You could read the Bible. You could say you believe the Bible. If you believe in five gods, you're just not a Christian. Secondly, the Bible provides us with creedal content. I think a lot of people miss out on this fact. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. This is the same chapter that we just alluded to with the whole resurrection theme later on. 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, we have creedal content. Whose creed is it? Well, from a personal perspective, it's Paul's creed, but it should be your creed as well, because this is the apostolic tradition contained in the scriptures. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. In accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, that is, died. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And he calls all of this, what he just said in verse 3, that which is of first importance. Okay? Paul gave us a mini Creed, a creedal statement that many Christians would go on quoting, reciting, and of course firmly believing throughout history. Now if you go to Philippians chapter 2, we get an, another interesting creedal statement. It is a very Christ-centered, as all should be, creedal statement. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 onwards. Well, we should actually start in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, this is a creed, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And it goes on. So many would say, what is the Latin term for what they call this? Carmen Christi? Carmen Christi? So many scholars, early church scholars would say that this saying right here, all the way until um, uh, possibly verse 11, this saying right here was a creedal statement that even before Paul penned these words was a creedal statement that was already being circulated among the house churches. And it made its way into the New Testament by God's affirmation because what is contained truly is the Word of God. We're not arguing that... The, the, the creeds themselves are inspired in their words or so on. Of course, this is the apostles' writings under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's unique in this. Point being, though, Christians in the earliest days were a creedal people. One of my favorites, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Um, verse 5. I'm in 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. That is another creedal statement that you would have seen being circulated among early 
Christians. And of course, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Now this really is, and I, I think this is sufficiently proven, not only in terms of the literary style, but early church tradition. This is an actual short confession or creed that, mo- that very likely was being sung in the house churches. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, speaking of the incarnation, vindicated by the Spirit, speaking of the resurrection, seen by angels, speaking of all the ministry of Christ, proclaimed among the nations, speaking of gospel preaching, believed on in the world, speaking of Christ's work in regenerating sinners now, and taken up in glory, speaking of His ascension where He is at this moment. You can, you can start picking thoughts out of that and even drawing out the Apostles' Creed just from that. There it is, an early creed and maybe even hymn that the early Christians used. So the Bible provides us with creedal content. And um, D. Matthew Allen in, in, in the Founders Journal, uh, in an edition talking about looking closely at confessions, says these are early creedal statements. Creedal fragments are also found in some of the verses that we've talked about in 1 Peter 3.18, 1 John 2, 1 John 5, among other passages. The writer of Hebrews instructs us to hold fast our confession and the confession of our hope. Now it's no surprise then that most of the verses that we looked at, some of the earliest Christian creeds, even up to the Reformation confessions, took directly from those passages in formulating their creedal statements. So... Core truths you must believe. The Bible itself has creedal statements. Thirdly, there were people, and there still are people, who claim to believe in the Bible, yet taught false doctrines. Right? So there are some people, like I said earlier, who claim to believe the Bible. Maybe you were one of them, or you used to be taught by one of them, or you were in one of their churches. They claim to hold to the same holy book. But their interpretations and conclusions were skewed, and twisted, they were in error. And one of the ways that we make it clear, we are biblical Christians that believe this over and against these false teachings is by making it clear in our creeds and confessions. So that, I mean, let's get, make a really practical example. Somebody's come from one of these false churches, and when you come from a false church and you come to the truth, oftentimes you can be very nervous coming to a true church or coming to a new church. You think to yourself, is it going to be like them? Are they still modalists? Are they still super duper charismatics that have the false view of of, of the spirit? Are they still this and that? How comforting it is then to come to a church that goes, oh, you want to know what we believe about about that stuff? Here, read this. Here, here, Here it is, 32 chapters. Nice little summary. Seems a bit long. You can read it quickly. One sitting. Check it out. That's what we believe about this. That's what we believe about the scriptures. That's what we believe about the government of the church. Oh, oh, you came from a church where you had like a super apostle and he was running the whole show and he was saying what's what and he does everything that he wants and you just bow down to whatever he teaches. Don't worry, chapter 26, the doctrine of the church, let me tell you about office bearers. Let me tell you about elders and deacons. Let me tell you about the fact that they are congregationally selected, not self-appointed. It's all there. So... Some co- yeah, because if you were congregation, yeah, if you were self-selected, it would just wouldn't have happened. So, we g- <laughs> so some common objections, some common objections. No creed but the Bible. Oh come on, you smart folks. What's wrong with this statement? Oh yes, Seth. Boom. <laughs> yes, that's right. That is a creed. What is a creed? It's a statement of faith. It's a statement of what I believe. This person is saying, I believe no creed but the Bible. So you're, you're presenting a creed in order to refute that we use creeds. Right? It doesn't really make sense. And by the way, this creed of yours, no creed but the Bible, it's a very, very bad creed. Okay? Because all the heretics also say no creed but the Bible. All the false teachers also say, I only teach the Bible. I only teach the Bible. Back in the Philippines, there's lots of cults. And you know what they're really good at? They quote nothing but Bible. So they'll go into these public debates, and you know, they'll talk about justific- you know, some they'll debate a, a Protestant Christian, justification by faith alone, blah, blah, blah. They'll pull out James, or they'll pull out one of those other verses about the necessity of works. They'll give no commentary. They'll quote it really loud, because that's what wins debates, right? And usually in these debates, they bring huge crowds. They'll quote it, 
and they just put a finger in their face. That's what the Bible says. Wow, and everybody just, yes, yeah, you're, you're done. You're done. No commentary needed. No explanation needed. So, is that personal experience? I've, I've been to a couple of those. It's, ve- it's exciting, but it's also, it's also very bad. Um, somebody, somebody would say it goes against sola scriptura. That's really weird because the very people who came to the conviction of sola scriptura are the very people who began writing creeds and confessions. Why? Because they so, for example, they so believed in the importance of sola scriptura, I don't know, that they came up with the idea to say, I believe in sola scriptura, which is a creed. That's why. Because it's so important that I must state it. We must state it. We as a church must state it. We are a church that believe that... I'll give you an example. I don't want to misquote it. We as a church believe, I should memorize it. It's the best one, first sentence of any confession you can read. That the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Dot, dot, dot. That's a wonderful way to start a statement of faith. That's, that's a way of protecting this church from any other outside authorities that are unbiblical. Yes? Oh, that's from the London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 1, paragraph 1. Yeah, good. So, the moment a Christian begins saying, look, look, no creed but the Bible. I, I believe that the scriptures alone are the only infallible rule of all saving faith that's yeah that's what we're doing bro that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying what you just said great confession keep going keep going uh somebody would say crazy for roman catholics and it's true some people uh in a lot of protestantism we have let go of our rich christian tradition we've let go of the creeds and they'll be like oh, you're reading the apostles creed in church are you guys roman catholics and i was like hey man the roman catholicism didn't it exist it didn't even exist when the Apostles' Creed was written. That's like a super duper later thing, okay? Uh, so yeah, Constantine, come on, what is he, right? So, uh, creeds are outdated, and some might say because it's Old English, that's fine. We have a modern English version. Okay, done. All right, so why should we, why should we today, not just the early church, why should we use creeds and confessions? Well. Um, this is taken from um, a great article of the Founders Ministries, The Biblical Basis for Creeds and Confessions and Statements of Faith. You can look it up. The authority of Scripture is not what false teachers often deny. So don't forget that. The best false teachers, they come rocking up, and they don't start telling the Christians, oh, no, don't worry, I'm going to teach from the book of, from, you know, some crazy book. Don't worry, I'm going to teach from the monastic gospels. No, we'd kick him out right away, right? A good false teacher will come in and go, I teach from the Bible. It's all Bible, man. It's all Bible, right? So that's not what they deny. They deny what the Bible says. They want to twist the scriptures. There are false interpretations of the scriptures, and that's what we need to avoid. Confessions help clarify biblical truth by affirming and negating the validity of various interpretations of scripture. If we believe there is a meaning, the word of God has meaning, and through sound exegesis, we can actually draw out the true meaning of the text of the Word of God. What does that mean? Other interpretations that go against the Bible's meaning are false interpretations. And a confession is a way for you to say, when I read Philippians chapter 2, I don't believe that Jesus emptied Himself of His divinity. As I confess, as you can see in our statement, we believe that He is truly and holy and fully and completely divine and man, God and man, at the same time. He has a true divine nature, a true human nature, and what what happened when He walked this earth was that He veiled His divinity. He didn't throw it away. He didn't cease to be God. He didn't lay His divinity aside. And you can even get to deeper stuff like the the extra Calvinisticum and and the idea that Jesus continued to be the divine, omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing God of the universe as per His divinity, even though as per His humanity, the God-man was truly local in a body and He walked this earth. Yeah, good stuff. So, confessions or confessing the faith with a summary of biblical doctrine, again, follows the biblical example. You remember when Peter was like, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was like, 
Yes. True. Correct confession. And then he tells them, well, this rock, I'm going to build this church and everything. It was good. It, that's the correct confession. Say it. Believe it. I hope you're not speaking through your teeth. I hope you really mean it. That is the truth. So we follow that biblical model. Now, for the remainder of our time, I want us to do a bit of a historical study to, to show you, to illustrate to you how important this stuff really is. I want us to look at some of the early creeds, one in particular that was later revised, improved, and the doctrine of the Trinity. So, the Apostles' Creed, it reads, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus... Let's read it together. Ready, set, go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Or the living and the dead. Amen. Keep going. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen indeed. And I don't know about you, but I yearn for the day that we would be so well taught historically and theologically that we no longer feel that we need to put an asterisk next to that word Catholic, and then, you know, have like a, a footnote here that says, not the Roman Catholic Church, but the universal church, right? Because that's obviously what we mean. We're not Roman Catholics. We're speaking of the one true, holy, universal church of Christ comprised of all of God's elect. At least I hope that's what you mean when you read it. So, that's the Apostles' Creed. Michael Haken writes, and uh, the Apostles' Creed is a very early creed, okay? Early centuries. And um, it represents what the early Christians believed about the doctrine of the Trinity. How good is it to know we believe the same thing? Michael Haken, church historian, writes, Until the beginning of the 4th century, an unchallenged Trinitarianism prevailed in the church. Not saying there's no false teaching. Just saying this is what the Christians affirmed. For example, Irenaeus of Lyons, who sought to evangelize the Rhone Valley from the church at Lyons, has a vision of the Godhead that is explicitly Trinitarian. He could call the Son our Lord and God. Well, Thomas could too when he touched his wounds, my Lord and my God. So it only makes sense. He employed the adjective eternal to describe the Holy Spirit, thereby implying the Spirit's deity. And over against Gnostic speculation that this world and its inhabitants came into existence through the work of a being who was not the true God, Irenaeus asserted that God made all things without the assistance of anyone outside of himself. Creation ex nihilo. And yet... He did have help, namely, what Irenaeus calls, I like the language, the hands of the Father, namely the Son and the Holy Spirit. You want to bind that up in biblical language? The Word become flesh in whom and through whom all things were made and apart from whom nothing else was made. So yes, Trinitarian theology, a Trinitarian view of creation. So the Apostles' Creed was a very important document because it represents an overwhelming consensus in the early church regarding God the Father, the Son, who became incarnate, and the Holy Spirit. Early Christians were not afraid to declare, this is what we believe the Bible says about Jesus. Hey Gnostics, and then later on, hey Arians, I know that's what you're saying, this is what we're saying, okay? We don't agree, and I want you to know that. The creed, Apostles' Creed, we like it, remains a symbol of faith for Christianity. It does. I, I absolutely can say with confidence that somebody who truly believes the truth contained in the Apostles' Creed is a Christian. Now, it might be controversial because someone might say, oh, it's deficient. And that's what I'm saying. Truly believes the truth contained in there. Because if you truly believe and understand what the Creed is actually saying, if you truly understand that part that says that the way that we are saved is through the person and work of Christ in no other way, by implication, uh, I, I would say that you're believing and resting in Christ alone for your salvation, and you believe in the one true God, and you believe that it's by Christ's merits and not our merits. Now, you need to tease that out a little bit, but again, it's a symbol of faith. The essentials of who God is, what Christ has done for sinners, is right there. In comes a man whom you may know named 
Arius. Arius believed that God the Father alone, the cause of all, is without beginning. Okay, well, it's not so bad. But then it gets bad. The Son was created by the Father as an immutable and unchangeable perfect creature. You might be able to think of some cults now that actually are functionally, technically Arians. And thus is not the everlast, not everlasting or co-everlasting with the Father. In Arius' words, the Son has a beginning, but God is without beginning. Hmm. For Arius, there was a time when the Son did not exist. Uh-oh. A time when it is inappropriate to call God Father. So, here's another problem. God becomes Father. That's, that's not good. As for the Holy Spirit, by Arius' reckoning, He was even less divine than the Son, for He was the first of the creatures made by the Son. Heresy. That's what that's called, right? Uh, and the early Christians recognized this. And so, 325... Uh, a council was pretty much called of bishops from all over the place called the Council of Nicaea. I'm not going to get into all, you know, the stuff and the Constantine and the this guy and the that guy and everything, okay? So they were called and they were like, hey guys, people are confused. And we need to get some of the best minds together, those who know the scriptures, and, and we need to lay out clearly what we actually believe about this whole Godhead thing, this whole Trinity thing. They weren't even using that language per se, right? We believe in one God, the Council of Nicaea says, Nicene Creed says, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. Now, stop right there. As a confessional people who hold to a late Reformation confession, we obviously are a people who believe that theology can be developed more robustly and more deeply over time as more and more saints meditate upon these same truths. We are not against saying, Apostles' Creed, that's great, there's more that we could say. And we're not even afraid of saying, Council of Nicaea, you guys did well, but did you know that most of the quote-unquote Nicene creeds that you read when you look them up are probably the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed? I said that right? Um, which is the revision, not in 325, but decades later in 381 by the Council of Constantinople. They took the same creed and they said, why? Because there are more prevailing threats to the doctrine of the Trinity now, there is more that needs to be said to protect us from error. So in the Council of Constantinople, check this out. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth for more clarity, biblical clarity, and of all things visible and invisible. You know, there could be a jab there at the Gnostics, there could be a jab there at the other people that were saying some weird things about creation. He makes it, they make it clear he's a creator of all things, heaven and earth. Nicaea goes, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Council of Constantinople just goes, oh, even better, that's good, let's, let's get even clearer. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, from here, we get further meditations later on about, about the eternal begottenness of the Son. And from there, you get meditations further in later confessions that, that speak of the eternal generation of the Son, the eternal procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son, all because of meditating upon the same truths in the Bible. Begotten of the Father... And um, there are some things here and there. Constantinople says, Begotten of the Father before all worlds, before eons. All right? Light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Such a clear statement on the Trinity. By whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth. All right? So basically what they did is they took the heaven and earth statement, put it to the very beginning to talk about the nature of God's creating act, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and was made man. More clarity in Constantinople. Came down from where? From heaven. Was made incarnate. How? By the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary. That's straight up from Matthew chapter 2. And was made man. Why do you think? Here, here's a question. Let's just theorize. Why do you think they felt later on uh, the, ne the necessity of including there? He was incarnate by the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary. Any possibilities? What kind of teachings, false teachings creeping in might this address? Yeah, Ian? Well, um, well, the Gnostics. Possibly the Gnostics. And I forgot the other three. But, um, that the soul of matter is all evil, basically. 
Sure. And they are being born the Virgin Mary basically says that yes, she was actually born from a human. Yeah, some people believe that. Some of the Gnostic Gospels say that she was beamed, yeah. Jesus was beamed out of her womb and that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dominic? Uh, to be denying the uh, virginity of Mary, um, the virgin birth, I mean. That's, that's a possibility as well. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a possibility as well. And I'm not even saying that everything you've said is correct as to the, co- the historical context of why they wrote these words. I'm, I am showing you the, the, the genius in, in wording things very carefully like this and how it, as you yourself have just observed, automatically rules out a bunch of false interpretations of Scripture. He suffered, and the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven. Now Constantinople's like, hey we got to say more about this, all right? He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried on the third day, rose again. According to the scriptures, where does he get that from? That's following in the footsteps of Paul's personal creed and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. Now, be honest with me. In the initial council of Nicaea and even in the Apostles' Creed, what do you, when we just read it, what do you feel was lacking when we read the Apostles' Creed? And, it, and don't talk about like a, a long discussion on justification by faith alone. We get there eventually, okay? What, what do you think was lacking? Because it's, it's Trinitarian. It's about the Trinity. What do you think was lacking? Maybe the Trinity. And I would say yes, yes. A strong emphasis on the absolute co-terminal um, divinity of the Son with the Father. Yeah, I, I would say, and the later creeds will have that, but... How about a little bit about who the Holy Spirit is? So, judge the living and the dead, again, with glory and so on, whose kingdom shall have no end. And Constantinople goes on to... So, in I see it's, we believe in the Holy Ghost, the communion of saints, the Holy Catholic Church, and so on and so forth. And it basically ends soon after. Constantinople goes, and could anybody guess why Constantinople goes? Like, we got to talk about this? Yeah, which was? The spirit fighters, the people who said the spirit was not divine between the Nicene and the Catholic. Exactly. And Arius himself, obviously, was also denying the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life. Sorry, what was that? Uh, not necessarily, no. But there were pneumatomachian Arians, there were non pneumatomachian Arians. Oh, no, I'm talking about Arius himself. He was a non pneumatomachian Arian. It's very weird. Anyway. Yeah. Well, in, in the quote from Arius earlier, he saw the Spirit as even lesser than the Son. Well, implication. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not his words. Yes. You, oh, oh, divine, is that why? Yes. Yes. They're, still, they're all divine yes, to Arius. Right, exactly. They're all divine to Arius, but not in the same way. They're lesser than the Father. Correct. The Lord and giver of life who proceeded from the Father. Um, there is a later debate that would happen when, when Christians start going, proceedeth from the Father and the Son which we affirm, it's in our confession. Some people don't like it. Some Eastern people don't like it, right? Who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. So what do we get? A more complete picture of the person and even the work of the Holy Spirit, the personhood and role of the Holy Spirit. And then it goes in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now, that becomes known as... uh, I actually forget it, but it's quad something. The quad, quad, not the quadriga, the quad something, which is the four old school marks of the true church. That it is the one holy, catholic, apostolic. One church, not two churches. Holy, a set apart people by God. Catholic, that is universal. Every tribe, tongue, and nation has the people of God. Apostolic, as in traces itself all the way back to the teaching of the scriptures. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And I think you would say, I'm, I would be more, more comfortable affirming Constantinople as my own creed. I would be pretty happy if this was my church's creed, or at least part of it, if you will, because it does more robustly represent the truth of the matter. Now, Nicaea had an addendum, if you will, um, to those who say there was a time when he was not, speaking of Christ, and he was not before he was made. 
He was made out of nothing. He is of another substance or essence. Or the Son of God is created or changeable or alterable. They are condemned by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So one of the things that Constantinople actually did is they took some of the best parts of that addendum or that added statement and they actually put it into the creed itself because it probably does belong there because we need to protect that, especially from the heretics that were teaching against the equality of the Father and the Son and even the divine personhood of the Holy Spirit. And so Athanasius comes into the picture, right? And he, he's, he's a part of all of these Arian controversies and so on. And um, well, he says here something that is reflective of all of the sound Orthodox Christians of his, uh, uh, not, not necessarily of his time, but who are on the other side of the victory against Arianism and anti-Trinitarianism. All who desire peace with us, <laughs> ought to anathematize the Arian heresy, to confess the faith that was confessed by the Holy Fathers at Nicaea, and also to anathematize those who say the Holy Spirit is a creature and separate Him from the being of Christ. For a true departure from the loathsome heresy of the Arians is this, a refusal to divide the Holy Trinity, or to say that any member of it has a, is a creature. For those who pretend to profess the faith, confess at Nicaea. Because guys, do you know why Constantinople also happened historically? Because people continue to say, oh, I affirm, 325, the Nicene Creed. But they interpreted it in an Arian way. Or in an anti-Trinitarian way. Because you could just be literalistic, read the plain words of the creed and go, there's no statement, you know, like in many of the books we read today, within the one being that is God, there exists three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, by the way, London Baptist Confession has that. But they didn't have that back then. So people were affirming it, and they were actually being double-tongued. And they were not being truthful and honest to what the words actually meant. Because those who pretend to profess the faith confess at Nicaea, but, Nicaea, but who dare to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, do nothing more than deny the Arian heresy in words while they hold it fast in thought. You're claiming to believe one thing, but you actually believe another thing. And this short study that we just did, this little historical study that we just did, um, not the topic for today, but shows us that throughout history, we have not only seen the necessity of using and writing creeds and confessions, but also the necessity when the Spirit of God gives us fresh light in the Scriptures, and maybe when the times necessitate it, to revise, to improve, to further develop and maybe even add to some of our early statements of what we believe. Take note, Constantinople, they just followed the principle for a good creed, which uh, we've come to today, the exposition and summarizing of Scripture. They did nothing else. If they did anything else and it was unbiblical, we wouldn't be affirming it. We shouldn't be. Further expounding on the Nicene Creed as well. So that's, that's important because our reference point, our ultimate authority is the Scriptures, but we are not so haughty and boastful to think that the brilliant minds that have come together before us, that have written these creeds, have nothing to offer us. It is not unbiblical to refer to the previous creeds and to draw from them. Okay? Because I'm telling you, do you know how many brilliant theologians had to come together to do con the Constantinople revision? You know how many divine... The Westminster Assembly was one of the most amazing assemblies there ever was with the best of the best theologians from all over the known world at that time. And they hammered it out for two years, meeting week after week after week. There was preaching, there was minutes, there was everything to come to the wordings of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Far be it from us to think, me alone with my pen, I'm going to come up with something way better by myself than the Westminster Confession. Probably not. And that's why it was good that we followed in those footsteps, even when we made our revisions. And these creeds must be, must be viewed, let me introduce a term, a couple terms, as norma normata, which means a rule that is ruled or a norm that is normed, not a norma normans. That is a rule that rules. A norm that norms all things. The only norma normans is the Holy Scriptures. We call, I have it in the back of my Bible, our London Baptist Confession of Faith, a subordinate standard. It comes under the word, you see how it works? 
it comes under my Bible, okay? It's not like this. It's like this. It's below the Scriptures. It is a subordinate standard normed by the Scriptures alone. Creeds are not infallible, or actually, you could say, if we hold that they are truly setting forth biblical truth, the truth is unfailing in that sense, um, why don't we say this at the very least? The words of the creeds are not inspired. Okay, let's say that. The words of the creeds are not inspired. I actually changed that. I don't know why it's still the same. They are subordinate to the scriptures whose words are actually inspired. Okay, and so they are worthy of honor to the degree that they accord with the teachings of the word of God. In the words of Augustine, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan creed was a fence around a mystery. It's not saying, it says everything there is to be said about who God is. I mean, God is, God is incomprehensible in the ultimate sense. But it's a fence around a mystery. It protects the mystery of the Trinity. It defends the church from anti-Trinitarian errors. And I want to close by asking, what is the big deal? Well... What was the big deal for that whole Nicene and Constantinople and all that stuff that was going on? Well, especially for them, and it should be for us. It was a matter of life and death. Guys, it was a matter of salvation and damnation. Because, as our own confession of faith says, the doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him. If we do not have a triune God, there is no true communion with God. Any other God apart from the triune God of the Scriptures is not the one true God. So it's a matter of life and death. How well do you know your church's statement of faith? Now, maybe we've got some guests from other churches as well or some regular visitors. How well do you know your church's statement of faith? And members, how, do you know, how well do you know our church's statement of faith? It's not just because we want to be really cool Reformed Baptists, right? And we want to have 1689 mugs and tattoos and all that. It's because we must know what our church confesses, for we are called to be honest about what we believe, not double-tongued. Members, I address you specially. You made a vow in your membership covenant that you would wholly support the teaching ministry of this church and that you affirm that the sec Second London Baptist Confession of Faith is a faithful summary of those things surely believed among us. Okay? By the way, we also have something in our confession that talks about lawful oaths and vows and how we have to take it seriously as Christians when we say something. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And you can't really be honest about that if you've never even read what your church teaches. And I know it's part of the membership process. Um, I'm just saying we, all, it's, 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 it, we, we believe that people are honest until proven guilty. So when somebody says in their membership interview, I read the confession, okay, okay, cool. You have any objections? No, we have no objections. That's great. I just take your word for it, okay? But if there are some of you that haven't actually read it and studied it in any way or understood it, well, number one, shame on you. Number two, yeah. praise God that we're going to be going through the whole thing yeah. for a couple years. We're commanded to publicly confess that Jesus is Lord and a creed or confession allows us to do that together. So, that's part one. A couple minutes for any questions that you guys might have. Yes? Okay, um, so heretics uh, simply quote the scriptures yes. and do not explain them. Um, what stops future waves of heretics from simply quoting confessions and not explaining them? Um, and then... How many layers of expositing confessions yeah. are we to go on? Yeah. One possibility is infinite. Not uh, potential infinite. Okay. <laughs> There's no actual infinite. Okay. Aside from God. It's a potential infinite. Right? Um, but that's not helpful. That doesn't make any sense. That sounds hopeless. We're just going to keep revising ad nauseum. And we're just going to keep... Um, commenting and commenting and then commenting on our comments and then commenting on our comments and commenting on our comments, right? And, and this is where, so hear me out, this is where I think the ministry of preaching and teaching in the church really shines. Because definitely there are churches that will hold to historic creeds and confessions, but they are dead churches. Dead orthodoxy, as they call it. 
So cheerful confessionalism must be coupled with the faithful expository preaching of the Word of God. We don't come to church, sit around and read from our confession. Okay, that's not all, that's all we do. We come to church, we do hear from our confession, but the meat, the primary thing, the primary means of grace is the ministry of the Word. So preachers and teachers especially have a role to be able to, as the qualifications like in 1 Timothy and in, in, um, in, in Titus say, they need to be able to refute those who contradict it. You see, we cannot rely wholly and completely upon a written, a written creedal statement. A written creedal statement can become functionally useless without real spirit indwelt and empowered preachers and teachers of the Word of God. So you are right. It's, and I would say it's not infinite, but you are right. Te false teachers will come in, they'll just, they'll just um, quote, and they've done it. And that's why, you know, there are trials and stuff like that in church courts, and that's why people are tried as heretics, not only watching if they actually quote um, the correct statements, but actually are asked questions and are tested and those kinds of things before you would deem somebody truly a heretic. Um, but that's why we need to keep the church alive through the passionate preaching of the Word of God. Um, so that way we have the Word of God as our ultimate authority, our creeds and confessions as a subordinate authority, and true spirit-indwelt and empowered Christian teachers and preachers who continue to defend that and announce that, rightly explain it, and refute those who contradict it. Thanks for the question. Yes, Chris. How do you defend that and say, yeah. Do you have it? yeah, no, and in one sense, we also say that. <laughs> in one sense, right, we also say that we are an expression of the true faith, trace ourselves back to the apostles. Anglicans say it, they love it. Roman Catholics say it, they like it too. Everybody's going to say that, and that's the thing, right? When it comes to truth and error, if, even if you're an error, somebody who truly believes that what they believe is true will, will say it as such. And they'll say, no, we have the truth. We've got the truth. That's why our traditions, our creeds and confessions must be normed by the scripture. So it goes back to Sola Scriptura. A lot of these groups that you're talking about, um, they might say that scripture is the authority, blah, blah, blah. But remember the, 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 the issue in the Reformation was not that Rome didn't see scripture as an authority. Rome saw scripture and and Eastern Orthodoxy con continues to do the same in many ways, especially in the way that they view the fathers. For them, authority is, yes, Scripture, and. For us, the authority is Scripture, and everything is normed by that. Even our tradition is normed by that. So at the end of the day, when we are in that kind of dispute, we should be confident that we can actually show them from the Scriptures that their tradition, as much good as it is preserved, has erred has deviated from the clear teaching of the Word of God and to actually show them from the Apostles' own words, you have deviated from the apostolic tradition. Especially when it comes to salvation and things like that. And, and even church, government, if you want. One more? Yeah, Lucas? Okay, that's fine. We'll do you and then we'll do Tanat Swa because he just went like that. So. And then we'll close. So in helping, like, pretty much the very first uh, argument that comes up when you're talking to someone about um, scripture versus tradition, yeah. when they equate it with the authority of scripture, um, is that the recognition of what is scripture relies upon tradition. Yeah. Um, how should we respond to them um, with reason? And yeah. Okay. Firstly, by disagreeing, right? That's the first thing you do, you disagree. You say, that's not true. And then you tell them what, what is true. So he, it, sometimes you just have to sort of compare. This is your view, this is my view, and I want you to understand why, okay? So their view, such as the Roman Catholic view, they view the church's role in terms of the canon of scripture, which books are in the canon of the Old Testament, New Testament. 
they view their role, and it was Michael Kruger, who is um, very much an expert in this area, they view their role as um, basically a, a thermostat, right? So they believe that they, for some reason, have the authority as a thermostat to define the temperature, to basically define by their God-vested authority or whatever, to say, this book makes it into the Bible, this book doesn't make it into the Bible. They wouldn't explain it that way. That sounds horrible, but that's what we're trying to say. You guys are saying that you have the authority to essentially choose which books are in the Bible and which are not. From a Protestant perspective, we view the church's role not as an infallible people who get to choose what's in or out the Bible, not as a thermostat, but as more of a thermometer, okay? We believe that our God has spoken. The same God has saved us through His Word, through the Gospel, spoken into our hearts. We were regenerated, and now we hear the shepherd's voice, and now we follow Him. So the church's role, especially in the early centuries, was not, oh, that's in, oh, that's out. It's to actually receive the Word of God, and like a thermometer, be able to recognize the voice of God, okay? It's, when, when we explain it like that, it sounds very subtle. It sounds very subtle, but that difference makes all the importance. It really does. We have a role of a thermometer. If you have the Spirit dwelling in you, so we have, you could even say we have a more supernatural view of the nature of how this happened. If you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, then Christians can come together and they, and they can listen to one voice and they can listen to the other voice and they can recognize the voice of the shepherd. I mean, and then there's historical matters as well, such as we know why we have the canon of the Old Testament and we don't have the Apocrypha. We can just reason in this way and just talk about how we know the Old Testament that Jesus affirmed. Here are the arguments, blah, blah, blah. Jesus affirmed that these were the books of the Old Testament when he made that statement from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was, you know, so he's telling you what his canon of scripture was and so on. So I can actually prove to you that the, our Old Testament today, even though the order is a bit different, is the Old Testament of Jesus and the apostles. We can see that very clearly. And then we could talk about the actual books of the New Testament, which were actually written by or under the oversight of an apostle at least. And these were actually written to real Christians who actually received them. You could even go out outside to extra biblical evidence that talk about the churches that received these letters, especially the epistles. They were actual letters written by the actual apostles, inspired by the Holy Spirit, sent to real congregations who then used them, read them, recited them, preached from them, and they were preserved because they were recognized as such. So there's a bunch of things that you could say, but the whole thermometer, thermostat thing, I think that's helpful. Last. I don't know if it's deviating a bit too much, but I'm going to ask in terms of tradition, um, such as things dating back to the apostles, how much... I, li I actually thought you were going to say such as things da like dating, and uh, I was just afraid that we were going to go that route again with you guys. <laughs> dating back to the apostles, yes. Yes, go. Um, how much are we allowed to take outside of scripture, so such as things like the, the Dachi mm -hmm. that people would read and some would say, yep. well, that's how Lind formulated to come about. Yes. All right. Easy much? answer to that, thanks for the question, is to go back to our principle and to say that scripture is the only um, um, norm that norms. All other standards are normed by the scriptures. So read the Didache, read the, the, the you know, Gospel of Ermas or whatever, and the Shepherd of Ermas and all that stuff. Read it and test it according to the scriptures. So in the Didache, there's a lot of practical counsel about Christian discipleship and church ministry. Okay, And we do also recognize that there are things regarding to the worship of God and the, the governance of the church that are not explicitly laid out in the scriptures, but can be found out through the light of nature and through Christian prudence. And sometimes this document will help with that. For example, there's an example in the Didache, what happens when you do not have running water? By the way, I believe the Didache is teaching that immersion is the way to go. And then it also talks about how, what if there's none at all? Does that mean we can't welcome anybody into the church? It talks about how, well, if you don't have enough water, maybe you can start pouring it on him three times and stuff like that, all right, to try to get that. And so I think there's practical things like that that you wouldn't get straight from the scriptures, but through Christian prudence and Christians that have thought about it before, it will at least make you think, I'll consider that. I'll consider that that might still be faithful. I still need to meditate on the scriptures. Um, now, the thing is, we're not really in a place where we're always running out of water, are we? 
Just like your baptism, right, Tenatsuwa? We're all good. <laughs> it's just like this shallow, but we did it. So, yeah, just practical things like that that you can find out. Always test it according to the scriptures. And if it's a matter of practical wisdom where the scripture is not explicit and there's some freedom in application, then you can, you can receive it almost like sanctified wisdom. Like wise Christians have thought about it and come to these conclusions. I might consider that and that might be valid. Okay. Wonderful. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God of truth. That you have sent to us the truth, Jesus Christ. And that you have made us a people of truth. You have brought us out of darkness and falsehood to the light of truth. And as a people of truth, we pray for your protection, O God. Protect us from falsehood. Protect us from lies. Pro protect us from the deceitful schemes of Satan, from error, from false teaching. But also, even though we know that these are real threats and that these things creep into even the best of congregations, may we not live a life of fear and anxiety. May we live a life of comfortable dependence upon the God of the Scriptures who has revealed Himself to us. And may we rest in that. And at the same time, equip us so that when those things do arise and the, fear, the threats do come, we would know how to rightly handle the word of truth, rightly divide the word of truth, to contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. Thank you for the blessing of being able to even do that as a church together. And may we do it not as individuals, but as a body. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.